Good. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here in uh, Ireland and speak to you and start off this session. And uh, as uh, Renee mentioned, I'm at Stanford and do both imaging and cardiovascular prevention. So today we're going to talk about atherosclerosis uh, and introduce you to both the biology and treatment uh, and provide some context for molecular imaging. <clears throat> so our department does have a research agreement with General Electric, and I uh, previously was on an advisory board for COA, Inc. So the outline of the talk will just introduce the very basics of atherosclerosis, what the term means, what it means clinically, We'll talk about the epidemiology and risk factors for developing atherosclerosis. And then we'll get into the biology and pathology of the disease. And uh, that leads us to a brief discussion of molecular imaging targets. There's a lot more at this meeting on molecular imaging techniques themselves. And then we'll talk about treatments. <coughs> So the basics, uh, so atherosclerosis is the medical term we use for the plaque buildup that happens within the artery wall. It's uh, derived from the terms athero and sclerosis. So athero is, means gruel or porridge or a soft material, whereas sclerosis is hardening. Uh, so atherosclerosis, the pathology is a combination of soft and hard tissue, uh, which we'll see as we go through. And then the most common and uh, major source of morbidity and mortality is related to coronary atherosclerosis, so plaque buildup in the coronary arteries, or what we call CAD, coronary artery disease. And the typical manifestations that uh, you'd all be familiar with, chest pain or medically what we'll, what's called angina uh, from uh, atherosclerosis in your coronary arteries, limiting blood flow, uh, and it can lead to heart attacks, and we'll talk about that in more detail. And a complication of heart attacks is sudden death and heart failure, which is really where the morbidity and mortality come from. You can get atherosclerosis in the carotid arteries, so it's a major risk factor for stroke. And then if you have involvement of peripheral vessels, primarily the leg vessels, where people develop symptoms of leg pain similar to chest pain uh, <clears throat> for the coronaries, and you can have ischemia or limb loss uh, uh, due to peripheral vascular disease or PVD. So here's a classic uh, from Starry who did a lot of atherosclerotic pathology. And uh, if I can get the pointer working here. So here is a coronary artery, and you have this large area of plaque, but you can see the lumen uh, is still open. And I like to call this, uh, in US units, the tenth of an inch problem, or because your coronaries are only two to three millimeters in size. Uh, and so you can see that even a plaque of a few millimeters, something quite small, can limit blood flow and contribute to heart attack. Uh, because your heart is supplied by such small vessels. Here's uh, just to lay out anatomy further, a CT angiogram uh, where you can see in one of the major arteries, this is your left anterior descending artery, that there's a non-calcified plaque here limiting blood flow. So we do have uh, multiple non-invasive ways as well as invasive ways to look at coronary artery disease. But the big problem comes not from the plaque that we just saw, which can give you some chest discomfort, uh, but chest discomfort <coughs> can be treated, and we'll talk about that later. Uh, what The big problem comes from what we call the acute clinical events, and the major one being myocardial infarction. So what you see here is a plaque uh, from a patient who had a myocardial infarction and died suddenly, which is why uh, there's this pathology specimen. So the plaque was here, 
And as the arrow points out, uh, there was a disruption within the plaque, and that led to a thrombus to try and seal up that area of rupture, or <clears throat> you could also argue that because the inner contents of the plaque were exposed to the blood and they're thrombogenic, that that started a clot, and then that clot propagated to fill the lumen. So you went from a plaque that was not that limiting, but now a blood clot has completely occluded the vessel, resulting in infarction or death of downstream tissue. And then you're prone to either the, if enough heart muscle is damaged, then it can't pump well, or uh, when you have this acute myocardial infarction, it can trigger a lethal heart arrhythmia uh, as a cause of sudden death. <clears throat> So, and then just at the organ level, so the main artery, this left anterior descending artery comes down here. This is the left ventricle, the main pumping chamber. And you can see there's evidence of a thrombus and the discoloration here of the myocardium indicates that it was ischemic. So switching over to the epidemiology, <coughs> So how important is coronary artery disease or atherosclerosis more generally? Uh, well, if you look, we, we used to show the statistics just for the developed world that it's the number one cause of morbidity and mortality, but it has now taken over as the number one cause worldwide. So as you can see on the far left, heart disease and stroke are by far the number one causes of death throughout the world. And then you can see there are several infectious diseases and about number six there is cancer or seven, uh, <clears throat> or lung cancer, excuse me. So really has become as we've exported our uh, sedentary and unhealthy diet lifestyle to the rest of the world, this has become uh, the dominant disease throughout the world. And importantly, cardiovascular disease these are statistics from the United States, but 75% of it relates to disease in the blood vessel wall with atherosclerosis, the primary pathology. So you see the dominant red zone is coronary heart disease, uh, and then stroke and diseases of the arteries uh, also are important components. So atherosclerosis really is the number one cause of uh, major mortality in the world. Another way to look at this is uh, over time that the vessel can start off quite normal looking and then develop this plaque and we'll go into it a little bit more detail. But as part of the epi epidemiology about one out of every two men and one out of every three women in the United States will develop clinical coronary disease. Most of us in this room have some degree of coronary artery disease already usually begins <clears throat> in the late teens, early 20s. Uh, and modifiable risk factors are present in oh, usually over 80% of patients who have heart attacks. So the notion that heart attacks happen to people with, uh, who have zero risk uh, is, uh, is really a fallacy. Uh, almost always uh, blood pressure, cholesterol, other things are, are not in their ideal state. <clears throat> and we can, I'll show you the slide that within the US adult population, fewer than 8% of that population is actually at low risk where they have uh, ideal values for blood pressure and cholesterol. A couple of studies that have looked at this uh, in terms of the risk factors that contribute to heart attacks uh, the largest in the U.S., combining several prospective studies, almost 400,000 patients followed for over 20 years, that if you had just one uh, or that over 80% of heart attacks occurred in patients who had at least one risk factor. So fewer than 20% of heart attacks were in patients who had none of these risk factors, and these include high cholesterol, high blood pressure, diabetes, and cigarette smoking. <clears throat> 
This was looked at worldwide. This was more of a cross-sectional analysis, not a prospective study, but over 52 countries uh, and 30,000 patients that nine modifiable risk factors explained over 90% of heart attacks. So uh, at least one of these was present in virtually every patient who had a heart attack. Again, cholesterol, smoking, diabetes, high blood pressure, as well as obesity, lack of daily fruits and vegetables, lack of regular exercise, and lack of regular alcohol consumption. Uh, some of you may be aware that uh, low levels of alcohol use are actually protective uh, for coronary artery disease. So this highlights the importance of prevention. Very few Americans, as I mentioned, are at low cardiovascular risk. And <clears throat> even um, more ominous is that this there had been an, a trend towards this improving, but that has started to reverse. So this slide is always a little confusing, um, but this is actually the percentage of the U.S. adult population who is at low risk. So we would love this to be 100% of the population was at low risk, uh, but the reality is that in the most recent sample, uh, under 8% were at low risk. And low risk meaning that the blood pressure was perfectly normal, cholesterol normal, normal body mass index, no cigarette smoking, and no diabetes. And as I mentioned, the trend was improving. So in the late 90s, or late 80s, early 90s, uh, we had gotten up over 10%, but with the increase in obesity and diabetes, um, <clears throat> which are usually then associated with increasing blood pressure, this trend has reversed. So let's switch over to the biology and pathology. So we mentioned this is a plaque accumulation, and the dominant theory has been that these risk factors, cholesterol, high blood pressure, diabetes, contribute to uh, an injury milieu uh, within the blood vessel wall. And the initial uh, insult leads to endothelial dysfunction. There's high oxidative stress, inflammation, you get lipid accumulation, macrophage infiltration, smooth muscle cell proliferation, and then as you get more advanced plaques, you get areas of necrosis, hypoxia, more fibrosis, calcification, and thrombosis. And the pathology we'll see can progress from a simple fatty streak to a quite uh, complex plaque with all of these uh, advanced features. <coughs> So this response to injury, uh, you have a lot of cytokine release causing smooth muscle cell proliferation, propensity for thrombus formation, lipid, or in this case LDL deposition, uh, and you have uh, neutrophils and other inflammatory cells uh, infiltrating the vessel wall. The question often comes up, well, it's a systemic disease, true, but there is a predilection for certain areas of the blood vessels. We talked about coronaries and carotids and peripheral disease. Uh, so it's been found that areas of low shear stress uh, are more prone to plaque development. So high shear is where the velocity is high near the vessel wall. If the velocity is low near the vessel wall, uh, it's a bit of an oversimplification, but that is associated with low shear stress. So areas of bifurcation, so very common, the left anterior, the left main bifurcating into the LAD and the circumflex, uh, that in the so-called shoulders of the bifurcation where there's low shear are areas of predilection. Uh, even more so, the carotid artery uh, not only has a bifurcation, but this carotid bulb causes low shear and recirculation, slow flow, and is uh, this internal carotid then is quite prone to uh, plaque development. Endothelial dysfunction develops when the risk factors promoting atherosclerosis are, <clears throat> are stronger. Uh, and uh, this slide illustrates 
tips the balance away from normal vessel physiology where your vessels are prone to dilate, uh, where there's a lot of nitric oxide available, uh, and you have limited proliferative response, uh, limited tendency for thrombosis, whereas in the presence of risk factors in the development of endothelial dysfunction, you have uh, oxidative stress, limited availability of nitric oxide, or more rapid quenching of nitric oxide. So you have instead vasoconstriction, uh, proliferation and uh, migration uh, <coughs> of uh, smooth muscle cells and vessel growth, and then a tendency for thrombosis and white blood cell or inflammatory cell uh, adherence and infiltration. Just as an example, uh, an MRI showing before and after delivery of nitroglycerin, a nice healthy response is that the vessels dilate nitroglycerin being a nitric oxide donor, and then tying in the risk factor uh, and healthy lifestyle, uh, we found that uh, elderly patients who pursued more vigorous physical activity had about twice as much vasodilation of their coronaries to nitroglycerin compared to those who really had a very sedentary uh, lifestyle. This is a classic figure, again from Starry, looking at the pathology of plaque progression. So early on, you can have some uh, uh, thickening, intimal thickening, uh, but then as lipid deposition becomes uh, more advanced, you have uh, this type 4 lesion or an atheroma, uh, and then as you have progression, it has fibrous fibroatheroma and then a more complicated lesion. <coughs> uh, this is shown nicely here in uh, an example from uh, Peter Libby's review, where you can see here the lumen with lipid deposition that can progress to what's considered a more vulnerable uh, plaque where you have even more lipid deposition, very little fibrous tissue between the lumen and uh, the uh, lipid-rich core, or uh, a more stable-looking plaque where you have a lot of fibrous tissue and fairly limited uh, lipid uptake and limited inflammatory cell involvement. So this balance between lipid inflammation versus fibrosis, uh, we'll see as we go on, talks about stable versus more vulnerable plaques. <clears throat> you can see here that looking more detail at the biology, that atherosclerosis involves progressive inflammatory and proliferative biology. So this early phase with uh, limited and nitric oxide availability progresses to having uh, adhesion cell molecule expression, and then you see the inflammatory cell involvement uh, as well as proliferation that uh, develops here. Another important component is what's called vascular remodeling. So this is the enlargement of the vessel that happens initially to maintain the vessel lumen size. It's uh, been termed the Glagov uh, phenomenon. <clears throat> the plaque can occupy up to as much as about 40% of the whole vessel area uh, before there's narrowing of the lumen. And active proteolysis and matrix metalloproteinases uh, play a major role in this plaque repair and remodeling. But as you can imagine, with active remodeling of the plaque, it's also more prone to rupture. This was the figure from earlier, and you can highlight here that the vessel, the lumen, will tend to stay the same size as plaque develops initially. You can see our intravascular ultrasound showing still a good sized lumen, but a fairly large eccentric plaque has developed, and that can be prone to this plaque rupture. Uh, and uh, also from Peter Libby, this balance between smooth muscle cells uh, producing 
proteins, collagen, et cetera, to stabilize the vessel wall, but there's also uh, <coughs> enzymes, MMPs, that will break down uh, the fibrous tissue. Uh, and this is enhanced in the setting of inflammation to make it more prone to rupture. So this gets us to the critical phase of the biology or pathology, which is this plaque vulnerability or disruption. Plaques up until now, if they just narrow the lumen, are relatively straightforward to treat. When a plaque disrupts or <coughs> uh, has pl plaque rupture, uh, often patients can't get to the hospital quickly enough to have that uh, treated to prevent heart attacks. So most commonly, these are eccentric lesions with only moderate stenosis, with a thin fibrous cap, less than 100 microns, and a large lipid pool, a cellular, typically inflammatory, infiltrate. And this rupture or erosion leads to the thrombosis that we saw earlier, which blocks blood flow and leads to the downstream ischemia and infarction. <clears throat> so filling in from the prior figure, here, this more vulnerable plaque has now developed a crack or a tear in the thin fibrous cap, and that's prone to thrombosis. So this is the figure we looked at earlier, just turned on its side to match this image, and that leads to the myocardial infarction as we saw before. So this vulnerable atherosclerosis or vulnerable plaque is typically characterized by inflammation. We talked about earlier, this is representing apoptosis. Uh, <clears throat> you have a necrotic core, typically. There's more lipid necrotic core area compared to the fibrous cap. And you also have angiogenesis and then hemorrhage and thrombosis. <clears throat> this is also happening, uh, similar pathology for the carotid. So Chun Wan's group, University of Washington. This is a patient who was treated and had their carotid plaque removed. And you can see it had a thin fibrous cap with actually intraplaque hemorrhage, which they showed nicely. The MRI before surgery showed right where the arrow is, the thin fibrous cap, and then bright on T1 weighted imaging showing uh, evidence of hemorrhage. And they've actually looked at this. Are these types of carotid plaques truly vulnerable? To prove that, you need to do a prospective study, image the plaques, and then see, do they cause stroke in the case of carotids? And indeed, they showed that either intraplaque hemorrhage or a thin fibrous cap predicted future stroke to a relative risk of five-fold to 17-fold. So this concept of plaque features that we've associated with vulnerability predict predicting future events, uh, that there are studies showing that. <clears throat> so this gives us, from the molecular imaging standpoint, many potential imaging targets. So integrins or adhesion molecules that are expressed early uh, in the disease activation, inflammation, as a critical phase associated with vulnerability. MMPs, collagen, elastin have also been targets for molecular imaging studies. Uh, apoptosis, anexin, and other uh, agents to image that. <clears throat> Hypoxia has been an area of interest uh, with this uh, necrotic core that can develop. Uh, angiogenesis also uh, is active in both coronary and uh, carotid uh, plaque development. Uh, and then importantly, fibrin, platelets, other markers of thrombus or hemorrhage are clearly indicative of uh, a vulnerable uh, or high-risk plaque. So what about treatment? Well, as a preventive cardiologist, in addition to imager, the first step is what we call primordial prevention, which is preventing getting the risk factors in the first place. So remaining physically active, following a healthy plant-based diet with limited animal fat and low carbs, uh, <clears throat> and maintaining a healthy weight, 
and not smoking or quitting cigarette smoking. Primary prevention uh, is then for patients who have risk factors controlling those, so all of the above treatments or interventions, and then if cholesterol or blood pressure or diabetes uh, are uh, ab out of whack, then those need to be treated. And secondary prevention for those who've been found to have disease or have had a myocardial infarction, the idea is to control the disease to prevent uh, subsequent events. So all of the above, again, plus what's been termed optimal medical therapy. Uh, there was a large clinical trial that instituted optimal medical therapy uh, as one arm called the COURAGE trial. So this was from that, uh, and it has an antiplatelet agent, so aspirin or clopidogrel or other agents to prevent blood clot formation. So what we saw was that a blood clot forming was the critical final step to causing a myocardial infarction. So this helps to reduce the risk of that. A cholesterol owing agent uh, is critical and has been shown to reduce the risk of heart attack and death by 30 to 40 percent as well as reduce the risk of stroke. So statins being the primary one uh, and additional agents as needed to cl control cholesterol. Beta blockers to block our uh, adrenal uh, uh, system, ACE inhibitors to block our renin-angiotensin system, and then as needed, calcium channel blockers or, or nitrates. Um, and then lifestyle, the things we talked about earlier, smoking cessation, nutrition counseling, exercise program, and weight control. Of course, there are mechanical therapies uh, when plaque gets advanced, and their goal is to restore normal blood flow. It's primarily for symptomatic disease, most clearly worthwhile in patients with acute myocardial infarction uh, or stroke or uh, peripheral uh, ischemia. There's angioplasty and stenting, and I'll show that. That applies to the coronary, carotid, and peripheral disease. Bypass surgery for both coronary and peripheral disease. Uh, and endarterectomy, or removal of the plaque, where that's most commonly performed in carotid disease. And I won't show a picture of that. So just the angioplasty is the blowing up the balloon. Um, so plasty to kind of fix angio blood vessel. Most typically that's done with a stent to maintain the vessel patency for, uh, with high success rate, and these are typically drug-eluting stents now. So you can see that <clears throat> the balloon inside the stent is inflated and then the stent is left behind. Bypass surgery using either your own internal arteries from the chest to bypass the area of blockage, or using a vein from the leg to connect to the aorta and go around the area of blockage. So it doesn't remove the plaque, it just redirects blood flow around the plaque so that the distal vessels and myocardium get good blood flow. There's still controversy as to the uh, advantages and disadvantages of these different therapies. There was a large comparative effectiveness trial earlier this year. Um, this is not prospective, but involved almost 200,000 patients from databases and showed initially the therapy between cabbage and PCI, PCI being uh, coronary stenting or angioplasty, uh, that had over time uh, cabbage uh, did better. <clears throat> There's still controversy too about optical medical therapy versus intervention in patients who have a narrowed coronary artery. Uh, the COURAGE trial that I mentioned showed over time that stenting really did no better than optical me medical therapy, uh, and this actually led to quite a reduction in the use of stenting. Uh, however, just this last week, uh, one of our Stanford investigators um, was involved in publishing the FAME-2 trial, which showed that PCI, when guided by evidence of impaired flow, uh, did better uh, than medical therapy 
as you see here, there were more uh, events in the medical therapy arm, though the main event was giving a stent to the medical therapy patients. So uh, it was not as much of an outcome-based uh, trial, which is a limitation. So for atherosclerosis, what would I like to see for the future molecular diagnosis and therapy? Well, almost everything was discovered on Star Trek, for those of you who've seen it or remember it. Um, where uh, you have Jim Kirk here lying on the simple, uh, completely non-invasive uh, imaging uh, system, though I'm never sure quite how they read that chart. But if you had, say, a PET CT scan with FDG lighting up in the coronaries, or if you had Renee giving contrast and showing both enhancement of the coronary wall and what looks like uh, uh, <clears throat> evidence of intraplaque uh, hemorrhage or thrombus, that we could say, you know, we see both a stenosis, but we have a couple of inflamed plaques that look ready to burst. Uh, and then we could give a targeted theranostic agent that could clear things up while we improve diet and increase exercise. So, and just acknowledge uh, collaborators. Uh, thank you very much.